This is going to be good. A walk down memory lane, my old Arsenal photos. I'm Alex Scott. <laughs> I'm a former professional footballer. I played for Arsenal for most of my career and won 140 caps for England. Without football, I actually don't know where I'd be. It's given me so much in my life and got me to this point. And I'll always be thankful to the game. Things have changed a fair bit since I retired. I've seen the women's game explode in popularity over recent years with record viewing figures and now record attendances. The game's massive and if I compare it, what I thought I was going to grow up into, the landscape's completely changed. TV exposure is growing and gradually players are becoming household names. That's cool! And as a result, women's football is one of the fastest growing sports in the world. Here's Lucy Browns! What a goal! What a goal! There is always a saying going around, if you can't see it, you can't be it. Well, now kids can see it and they can be it if they want to be. It's such a pivotal time, but I want to know how far the game can go and whether this growth is sustainable. To answer these questions, I need to take a long, hard look at where the sport is at and what challenges lie ahead. A woman has a right to have a baby and if she chooses to do it during a managerial career or a playing career, we need to best support that. Go on my Instagram, go on my Twitter, go on my Facebook. I think I have the right to use my mute button or my block button. Given where the game's going and the amount of support that we're getting, I think that it can only encourage different ethnicities to be part of the game. I care passionately about the future of women's football. That's why I need to find out whether this game that I love is in safe hands. Good touch, that. <laughs> this is so great to see, to come out here on a weekend and see so many young girls playing football, enjoying it, loving it, the parents on the side. You just didn't have this when I was growing up until I signed for Arsenal and I'd go off and play in really organised tournaments. There's no way I'd be walking past a local field and see this amount of girls playing. You'd see maybe one amongst a whole field of boys playing. Oh, I'm in! Oh, whose is it? Your ball! Go on then. Okay, mark up, go! Violet. Why do you think it is that they've started picking up a ball and playing? It's just a lot more there. The sponsorships of this league, are, you know, girls playing football, it's on Instagram, mm -hmm. they've got the games, they've got the Euros, so, you know, it's much more visible. And they enjoy it? They love it. Um, my little girl's grown in confidence. Even her teacher said at school, her really? confidence has come on. And oh, wow. She doesn't play with any school friends, so she's met a whole new group of friends who come in. So, yeah, they get loads more than just the tactical skills, I think. This is the most important growth area of the game, and it's fantastic to see. At grassroots level, participation numbers over the last five years for girls have increased significantly. There's now over a million players registered at age groups 15 and under. But today, well, today's all about having fun, and I love that. What about the serious end of the game at elite level? We need to be shining a light on our brightest stars to show these young girls what their future could hold. I've travelled to Barcelona, home to one of the most famous football clubs in the world and one of the most iconic stadiums on the planet. The new Camp has played host to some of the greatest matches in football in history. This is where every little boy who aspires to be a footballer dreams of playing. And now, every little girl.
tonight, Barcelona women's team are stepping out onto that hallowed turf for the first time in front of a crowd in excess of 80,000. The atmosphere is building. They are playing against Real Madrid in the quarter-final of the Champions League. I'm getting goosebumps. It's outstanding. I mean, the atmosphere, it's that like love for the club, the love for the team that you don't get in many places. And we're just living through a historic match today. It's been a development over the last couple of years for the women's team to actually get to this stage. Yeah, it's definitely been a long process. I mean, I think anything in women's football has been a long process. Like, even for me, like, I grew up watching the Ronaldinho's, the Messi's, the Xavi's, and now you come and you walk around and people have Alexia Putellas on their shirt, you know, they have the women's names on their kits walking around Camp Nou. All the build-up, the anticipation, almost kick off. I just hope it's a great game of football because that's what you want to get people to keep coming back. It also needs to be a good game of football. You hear that noise? I don't think I've ever experienced a noise like it within a women's game. more than empowerment that every young girl now knows this is a possibility that they can grow up and they can be playing on this pitch. It's almost hard to process the magnitude of what I've just witnessed. A world record attendance for a women's match, beating the previous record set at the Rose Bowl at the 1999 World Cup. It was a great game, Barcelona winning 5-2. They treated us all to some fantastic goals, the atmosphere, and when I think about it, 90, over 91,000 in attendance. It just makes you think, look, it's still cheering. <laughs> Everyone's absolutely loving it, what they have seen tonight. And it goes to show that once again, there is an appetite for women's football. We've seen the crowds, we've seen how great the game was. So it's what next? How do we carry this momentum forward? That is the question. Barcelona went on to break their own world record again just a few weeks later. It's worth pointing out, the club did give away some free tickets. But is that a problem? The huge media coverage means moments like this provide such a vital springboard for women's football. So how do we make these huge crowds the norm? Exposure is key. But it's not just filling stadiums that's important. I want to see our sport on the front pages and trending. Hi, hi. For that to happen, we need big stars and role models. Yo. Good to see you. Good to see you too. In terms of you, I feel like things have changed dramatically, like in an instant being named England captain. Yeah. You are basically now the face of women's football in this country. I know you don't want to think about it, <laughs> but you are. I think I think the, the territory that comes with that role, I understand that. So I think 100% I'm aware I'm somebody that is in a role that is very much celebrated in this country, I think, as well. It makes me smile, really does <laughs> your journey, because, you know, we all know, especially Arsenal fans, going from being a ball girl at games, yeah. <laughs> like celebrating both the men's side and the women's side, yeah. like as, as you are. And now you are gonna be that pin-up girl. Those young girls wanna aspire to be, to be you. Yeah. 
I find that I find that weird, you know. I was the girl that that had my role models in football. Mm -hmm. You know, like I don't see myself anywhere near what you guys were when you was playing. And then now somebody's looking up to me. I couldn't have just grown up to be a footballer like footballers of your generation because it's not it's not what the game is anymore. The mm -hmm. game's blown up, the game's massive and if I compare it what I thought I was gonna grow up into, as completely yeah. the landscape's completely changed. What did you think you'd grow up into? My dad always said to me like he really hoped that it would be a wage. Like I'd I could be a footballer, you know, like as a job title. Mm -hmm. You pay your mortgage because you're a footballer, you know, like all of those things. But I don't know what I expected, but it wasn't it wasn't this. Mm -hmm. It wasn't it wasn't people recognising you down the street or the opportunities that come my way just from being a women's footballer now. It's what are different. some of those opportunities? You know, I'll go to Italy next week with Gucci for a, for a fashion show. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> this is... <laughs> <laughs> it's like, don't say things because you... <laughs> I, love things it, like I love it, I love it. There are so many more commercial opportunities for the top players nowadays. They can make more out of the game than ever before. And crucially, their exposure means we generate more interest in women's football. There's been a huge change in commercial and media. Definitely the last couple of years, I feel more intensely it's grown, but if you compared it to 10 years ago, it would be drastic. I think that shows how far the women's games come, that People are being recognised, but also they're being included in huge campaigns. I think my time outside of football has changed in the past couple of years, doing more interviews and more appearances and things like that, but that's part and parcel of football, and it's only helping to grow the women's game. You know, I think possibly in the past year I've had more commercial stuff to do outside of football. I've probably done more in the past year than I ever have, really. People are recognising the characters. People are recognising elite sportswomen. Brands now want to get involved. Sponsors now want to get involved. You know, shirt sponsors will now want the visibility on television every week. It's great to see the growing exposure for players, but it's not necessarily a level playing field across the whole of the league. It's very hard to sometimes know what to think about sponsorship things because you see Lucy Bronze signed a huge deal with Pepsi that was one of the biggest that a women's player had ever signed. She's on the advert with Messi, Ronaldinho, and you see things like that, and that's a real marker of how far we have come. But at the same time, you're looking at a player like Anita Asante, who's a Champions League winner with Arsenal and has had an astonishing career, won the vast majority of trophies that there are to win, yet has never had a boot sponsor in her career there is a big disparity and I think that's the gap that really needs to be bridged so that all the professional players have the same kind of commercial uh, opportunities as well and that they're also displaying like a variety of different athletes and their personalities, the characters. I'm going to brand saying, got this player, this player, this player, would you like to work with them? Some companies are still obsessed with, we just need a lioness or we just need a striker. I think what the Lionesses do is potentially pave the way for what's to come within the future. They are role models, they are getting more girls into the game, they are bringing in that investment, they are bringing in that sponsorship. So, you know, yes, they are potentially earning more, but hopefully that is then going to be seen and it's going to be filtered down, down the leagues a little bit more. OK, so we're not there yet. Not every professional player is making money outside of their club salary which in the WSL can range from 20,000 to 250,000 pounds per year. But as Fern says, those big names have to lead the way, shining a light on the sport, growing the fan base and attracting investment, so even more players are given commercial opportunities in the future. Despite being the focus of media attention, fronting campaigns and playing to record crowds, frustratingly, there's still a minority who question the quality of the women's game, meaning players have to put up with patronising and insulting comments online. And can you believe there's even a hashtag, who cares? I mean, some of the tweets are just embarrassing and shocking, to be honest, like this one. 
Please stop giving so much coverage to women's football. It's all for nobody cares about it. There is never enough washing and cooking to be done for them to be playing football. Another one. Boys under 12 standard with the scoreline to match. Because Arsenal beat Aston Villa 7-0. Because there's never big score lines in men's football, is there? Like, <laughs> how pathetic is that? For me, the whole patronising thing and who cares, I actually laugh at. You just like, love it. Yeah, because you think, well, it was over in Barcelona, um, the record attendance. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. You can see there's a real appetite. And then you've got people saying, who cares? Well, 90, over 91,000 <laughs> yeah. people care. Yeah, it's So factual. then I'm like, actually, who's the one that looks stupid? Yeah. I, don't, I just don't yeah. get people's opinions on that. I think women's footballers take the patronising personally because it's my game, it's, I'm here to protect it. It's something that I want to build and grow. And I don't particularly like watching fencing, but I don't tweet to say that I don't, you know? It's like, if you don't like it, it means it can't exist. Why? Because it's women. Because if it was a men's sport, that wouldn't have, it wouldn't be spoke about in the same way. If you're a football fan and not a rugby fan, you don't want rugby to not exist. You just think that football's better. So you just watch football. But if it's women, then it means we need to remove it. Like, well, we're not going anywhere. I scored probably one of the best goals I've ever scored in my career and it went a little bit viral and I read the comments underneath it and everybody was just commenting on the quality of keepers in the women's game and not giving credit to the technique of the goal and I was like, the perception of the game needs to change. Most female athletes across sports have experienced this and we've almost come to expect it, this kind of misogyny that you see on these platforms. Um, and, you know, I dealt with a tweet like that recently where I just normally would ignore and just felt like I had to shut it down. I think it happens all the time. You could probably go on my feed right now, go on my, go on my Instagram, go on my Twitter, go on my Facebook. You'd see, I don't know, I don't say hundreds of comments, but you'd see plenty. But I think I have the right to use my mute button or my block button um, to filter what I see. And that's where I take control. I used to do this thing where I used to, wa I used to want to read them. For some reason, I used to just go on Twitter after a game and see what people were saying about me until I realised that it doesn't really matter what anyone else says apart from the manager and your family and your friends. It's constantly who cares, no one wants to see, no, no one wants to know, basically. And I think there's always people that do care and do want to know, and I think it's important that the younger girls who are aspiring to follow in our footsteps don't get put off by the who cares, the, no one wants to know. I think it's important to know that people do care. Before, maybe I'd say it got annoying that people would always say that women's football this or women's football that, but I think now it's just at a point where you're like, okay, well, we'll just keep, we'll just keep showing you what we're capable of doing. And at some point you'll get on board. It's, it's, it's just boring, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know, I think as a player for me, it's kind of like, we don't want to keep talking about the trolls and about the people who are speaking about us negatively. We want to focus on, on the good rather than focus on all people who just keep trying to put the women's game down. I look at the young girls now when they're walking in a train, all they're doing is on the phones and I'm just like, that is the world that we live in. And of course, social media can be really powerful, but for young players, they might hang on that one comment that can potentially be something that could distract them from wanting to play football or could really knock their confidence in a way. It's hard hearing how some players have been so personally affected by online abuse. Over time, I've learned to dismiss and laugh off the comments. If there's one piece of advice the senior players can hand down, it's to ignore the negativity, focus on your game and rise above it, girls. It's also important to remember the trolls are a minority. The high quality of women's football is clear. And because of that, it has a growing fan base. The hit is in magnificently! Vivi Miedema, best one for the season! The Women's Super League is England's top division and has been running since 2011, but only turned professional in 2018. Regardless of its infancy, some argue it's the best in the world. The WSL's massive. It's a special league because anyone can beat anyone in that league. Uh, you never know what's going to happen, and that's what's so good about it. 
In Europe, the WSL is leading the way as a marquee league because all of the teams are full-time professionals, whereas that's something that none of the other leagues in Europe can really live up to at, at the moment. The best players in the world are all coming over to play in this league. The standard of football is incredible and I just think that it's going to keep increasing and it's going to keep on improving and I hope long may it continue. Tonight I've come to watch defending champions Chelsea take on rival Spurs in a crucial match. But before the action kicks off, I want to speak to some of the most important people in football, the fans. <laughs> How long have you supported the team? So I got into women's football after the um, GB Olympics in 2012. And since then, I've just been an avid supporter. And Chelsea is my local club. And since then, I've just grown to love Chelsea through and through. Who's your favourite player? Oh, it's so hard to pick one. Uh, I, think, I think at the moment, I'd probably say Jess Carter. Just the, the improvement, particularly since I've started watching. She's just gone, get, gets better and better every game. <gasps> Can you, I see your flag? Wow. She made this. You made that? Yeah. And she also made this. Oh, wow. You guys are all prepared for tonight. <laughs> Does this mean you're going to be cheering loud as well? Yeah. yeah. What do you like coming down I to support it. the women? The Why? girls are absolutely at the better than boys sometimes. <laughs> Honestly, they're out of this world. I love them to bits. They get up, they fight for the ball. They don't stand around playing silly buggers. Mm -hmm. They get in there, get stuck in. The Football Association run the Women's Super League, or the WSL as it's known, and their women's football director, Kelly Simmons, has been involved from the very start. She's at tonight's game, so I want to speak to her about the FA's priorities. A lot of eyeballs on the WSL, and now that you know, we're coming back from COVID and everything's opening up, we've got to get those attendances uh, growing again. And I remember you know, before COVID, we were at Tottenham Arsenal, 38,000 in that fantastic stadium. It was one of those special moments. That's what you know, big games in this country, I think, will look like long term. We, you know, that's where we want to get to. So is the plan or the aim to have more games played at men's stadiums? Absolutely. I think it really helps to, to bring in and attract fans uh, of the club who we know are increasingly crossing over. They might have followed the men's club previously and uh, switching over and engaging and supporting the women's club. So that really does help raise the profile, especially after the opportunity of the Euros, where millions of people in this country are going to be watching the women's game and, and you know England games are sold out and it's a fantastic opportunity so it'd be great for the clubs to get behind the WSL and put some of their big games in, in the uh, main stadium and let's get those big big crowds back. Those occasions when we do play at the likes of Old Trafford and the Etihad and those are really special occasions for women's game and it only helps to grow the game. You kind of need it to happen to see what is possible and, and to continuously to think bigger because you know you can see that the capacities are there and people they want it they want to be able to go and watch you know uh, women's football at, at the very top level especially it's incredible to see women's football being played in bigger stadiums but there has to be the demand from fans to make sure the atmosphere and experience is everything it should be it's amazing that we're selling out stadiums for games but unless it's consistent, you know, what's it, what's it worth? Because the people who are maybe coming to them games, they're not going to come to the next one. It's, it's creating a legacy and it's cre creating a buzz where people want to come back again and come back again. Because we don't often get as many fans as the men do, when you play in a big stadium like that with not as many fans, for me, I don't like it as much because I like to fill the crowd a bit more and it kind of feels a little bit empty when you can't fill it that much. So I think it depends on... Depends on the stadium, depends on how many people we got there, but when you can do it properly and you have a lot of support, then it's an incredible feeling. was brilliant to see so many fans packed into King's Meadow, watching some of the best women's football there is out there. 11 years on from the start of this league, we've come so far, but I know we need to push things further. 
After the match, I went to catch up with one woman who I think is integral in shaping the women's game going forward. My old assistant coach and now Chelsea manager, Emma Hayes. Emma, do you say you're proud of what you achieved to push the women's game to where it is now? Yeah, of course I am. When you do something you love, you don't think about the impact it's going to have on everyone else or everything else. You just know you enjoy doing it and you just want to keep doing it. What I've probably learned over time is that I'm in a privileged position and I need to use that platform as best I can to try and grow the game. I've always wanted to make football as accessible as possible to, to everyone, to the masses, and being able to put the women's game into the consciousness of mainstream football, that's all I've really wanted, is that on Sunday people are tuning in and it's like, well, which game am I going to watch? Not is it men's or it's women? And I think it's actually getting to that point where mm. people are watching back-to-back -back football and they just want a good game regardless of gender. So you say about where the game is then in the WSL, because it is seen as the best league in the world at the moment. Why do you think that is? I think it's the whole thing. You, you might have some teams across Europe, Barcelona, maybe even Germany and France to say, well, actually, you, you don't have teams that are winning the Champions League on the level they are, which they're correct. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that, that it isn't the best league. Um, because I think the, the combination of FA experience plus uh, men's football clubs being involved, I think that's what's propelled our, our game beyond other countries. What lessons, if any, can we take from the men's game to help push our game forward? Well, I think the lessons we can take is from a sport that has had a high level of funding for at least 25 years. So that we know that it's a product that they know how to sell it worldwide. We've always sold our sport so cheaply and that's to get numbers in, and, but I think we have to reconsider that model. Emma's right. Football is a business or a product, whether we like it or not. And investment is key if we want to see the product grow even further. Barclays have been the main sponsor of the WSL since it became professional in 2018, investing £15 million in the game. They have now renewed that deal until 2025, doubling that amount to 30 million over the next three years. It's a significant development for the game in this country. So how is this larger investment into such a fast growing sport viewed by financial experts? The possibilities are endless. For a commercial partner being associated with a, with a sports asset like women's football, it gives them the opportunity to engage at all levels. Mm -hmm. What I'd hope is that we're now in a position whereby other brands will look at Barclays and they'll look at the position of the women's game and they'll see the scale of the opportunity. We talk a lot about this virtuous circle. You need that investment to help transform the game. You need that competition. You need that promotion. You need those broadcasting deals. And when it all comes together, it, clearly that, it means it's a more competitive landscape for us as a sponsor. Every year there's something else that happens, you know, the broadcasting deals that have been done, they're all steps on that journey um, to transforming the landscape um, around women's football that's going to make it even more competitive. But at the moment the game isn't profitable, is it? No, not at all. But it's not unusual for any business to require funding in its early years. And we must reflect on that as well. Whilst at times we're playing catch up because of everything that's gone before and that creates some quite emotive feelings. Actually, when you look at how far we've traveled in the last three or four years in particular, the investment will deliver the returns in the future. At the moment, I don't think it's a major concern that the clubs are losing money because it, it, it's about that investment and putting in the money to build something and get it going. But the long-term ambition has to be financial sustainability, otherwise you can't set up a, a loss-making model for the, for the long term. That it just won't be able to sustain itself. I think on the commercial front, globally, there's been a slow uptake to investing in women's sports. How to do that comes with more and more visibility. 
So with the better broadcasting, more visibility, better numbers, comes more and more marketing, commercial arrangements. And to get more of that visibility, the game quite simply needs to be on people's screens on a regular basis. Recent TV rights deals have changed the landscape in the women's game, with both the BBC and Sky airing the WSL, bringing audiences in their millions across the season. The decision to separate out the rights between the men's game and the women's game really is a highly significant moment. And nobody knew at that time whether it was going to work because previously broadcasters would have said, well, we had it really for free because it's what we paid for the men's game. And what we found incredibly interesting was that there was a real appetite for women's football. It's the first time we've gone out separately into the market for women's football for a specific deal. We wanted to really focus on partners who are going to help drive audience, but also drive revenue for the league as well. We think we've got the perfect blend of free-to-air with the BBC and the exposure that that brings and the audiences that brings, and Sky, who've got a wonderful track record in producing football. Probably a game-changing moment, really, for the women's game in this country. We wanted to be on television more. We wanted more games live, and now we have that every single weekend and every club is exposed to that limelight and to be on television. In the course of this first season, where the Women's Super League has been broadcast by both Sky and the BBC, we've actually seen audiences for individual games at over a million viewers. Again, these are unprecedented, and it shows how much the game has been changing in this last year or so. In order to reach even more viewers, Every game in this season's UEFA Women's Champions League was broadcast live on the DAZN streaming platform and YouTube with impressive results. It feels like women's football is not only having a moment, but it's having a movement. Fans have tuned in from over 230 countries and territories, so if anyone would ever still like to question the fact, but who's watching women's football? My, my answer is the entire world. If kids now have dreams about becoming a, a professional player, well, they can stick on the TV and they can choose between watching a men's game and a women's game. You know, that's fantastic. And they have female role models that they can look up to. You know, I didn't have any of that really when I was a kid. You know, there was always a saying going around, if you can't see it, you can't be it. Well, now kids can see it and they can be it if they want to be. Really wise words from Simone McGill. But while there are more women playing football on TV, there are still areas which need drastic improvement. When I think about the women's game in this country today, I can't get my head around the lack of diversity at elite level. It's not reflective of the game or society, in my opinion. And if you go back a couple of years to the World Cup 2019, out of the whole of that England squad, there were only two players that were not white. And since then, England have fielded teams that have been all white players. How and why have we got to this stage? And what are we going to do to ensure that that starts to change? I'm meeting up with Deborah Nelson, who was a promising young footballer. But she gave up playing after an experience with racism left her disillusioned with the game. Hey, hey. Hello, how are you? <laughs> oh my God, I feel like I need to on tiptoes, look. <laughs> Good to see you. Yeah. You too. It's been a long time. I wanted to speak to Deborah after seeing a concerning post on social media. For me to see you speaking out about this current England team, saying how, as a young black woman, this team does not mm. speak to you or inspire you, yeah. is so alarming yeah. to me. Like, why? Why did you say that? It's really painful, because it's like, I, don't, I think it's because you need to feel like you can see yourself in someone in order for them to be a role model. You need to be able to feel like you can connect with them. And if someone doesn't have the same lived experiences as you, isn't of the same background as you. Like, there's so many parts of someone's identity, and if you can't connect with at least one element of someone's identity, how can they then be your role model? We have to question why that's happening and, and look at, you know, what's going on in the, the bottom tiers of the game and grassroots and 
uh, you know, are they not there, which, you know, I highly doubt, or, or they're just not funneling through somehow to, to the right pathways. I think what's happened is that until quite recently, um, because the women's game didn't have a lot of money, it tended to run the academies or the, the, the sort of centres of excellence they used to be called at, at the men's training ground, potentially somewhere quite sort of leafy and rural. And therefore, not everybody had access to be able to come into that. And I think that's led to sort of a situation now where the pipeline isn't maybe as diverse as, as it should be. But I think that is changing. When I was playing, I was probably one in a team full of white girls and, you know, kind of really had to struggle to get to training. You know, my coach used to pick me up, then we'd get a bus, then we'd end up. So the, the ways in which we had to get to training were difficult and I think what we can learn from that is that we need to make the training as accessible as possible for girls who want to play the sport so that there aren't any kind of barriers to wanting to just play. In the last year, we've, we've had this player pathway review, which is about working with the clubs to say, how are we going to diversify and improve the talent pathway? So all of the work that we've been doing in the pilots is all about how do we make sure that we widen that base and we diversify that base so that we've got more and diverse talent coming through into our system and it's been a big focus. Given where the game's going and how much better it's, it's getting and the, the amount of support that we're getting, I think that it can only encourage different ethnicities to be part of the game. And that's what I'm kind of hopeful for, is that with the equal opportunities, with the more exposure, then more people want to join and, and have the opportunity to, to play. It's good to hear the FA are aware of the issues around accessibility to training and are putting plans in place to work with the clubs. But the FA are not the only ones working hard to help grow the game in all communities. Tell me about the work that you're doing now. Currently I'm working for Football Beyond Borders, which is an organisation that uses the power of football to engage young people that are struggling in school or from a disadvantaged background. A lot of what I've recognised through my own journey and what I've realised in school is girls football is either doesn't exist or is always the first thing to go. So for me, what my role is, is using a vessel, which is Football Beyond Borders, to be able to provide a school and also the girls that attend that school the opportunity to play football. I feel we've got to a stage where there's a lot of positive things going on, but this conversation with you make a lot of people realise that there's areas that we still need to work so hard on to turn corners. Thank you. So I appreciate you. Appreciate you for having this conversation as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. With only three non-white players in the current England Euro squad, how are things going to change? As we heard from Kelly Simmons, a lot of that work depends on recruitment into the game and how and where we find young girls that will take up the sport. I've come to East Manchester to meet my old captain, Jane Ludlow, who now heads up the academy at Manchester City. Hello, stranger. Hello, you. <laughs> it's been too long. Gosh, how long have you been? Lovely to see you. Welcome to Manchester. I know, this is a bit new for you. I know. You used to bark out red. orders to me on the pitch, <laughs> and now look at us in very different I roles. I barcode orders. <laughs> Let me show you around. Come then, let's go. To be honest, it's a fantastic facility. Obviously, it has everything we need, but we just need more of it now going forward, you know, with how quickly we're growing as a girls' academy. Uh -huh. Obviously, this was originally built for, for the men, for the boys' academy, but obviously we have the first team women who were part of us, this as well. Yeah. And now we're growing, so it is, you know, recognition of it's fab, it's great, but it, it is actually going to be bigger now going forward. Okay. Down below us is one of the gyms canteen we've just passed, obviously there's offices, educational rooms, as everything you know, players need from a development perspective and what we need from a staff perspective. It's pretty different when you think back to Oakland's College. <laughs> Oakland's College, the yeah. Arsenal Academy days. Yeah, early <laughs> 2000s, but they were fun days. But obviously, when you look at now what we have for young girls, mm -hmm. comparison to what you had, yeah. you know, went back 20 years ago, it's very different. We have specialist people now helping these young players develop. Yeah. Um, and it's great, in that sense, you know, we're part of a family. Whether you're part of the girls' team, the boys' team, the men's, the women's, it's family. Mm -hmm. um, and we're lucky, we obviously have a facility like this to develop in.
It's really exciting to see like the young girls coming through because especially at our club, it's like, okay, we have the resources to build a footballer that can come and play in the first team for Manchester City and imagine all the practice that they get and the coaching that they do get to become a footballer when they're 16, 17. You got first, I mean, you in. Can you tell me how you got into football and actually how you've ended up at Manchester City? It started when I was in like primary school. Mm -hmm. When I was about 11, I played for their school team. And then my teacher at the time pulled my mum and was like, yeah, you need to get her into a football team because she's really good. So then my mum started taking me to City in the community. The under 12 coach at the time came and scouted me from City in the community. And then, yeah, I've been there, I've been at City since, ever since. Oh, so you owe that teacher? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what about you, Jemima? I started when I was about four at a grassroots team. I wasn't just the only girl in the grassroots team, but I was the only girl in the whole league. I came to City, did a trial. They said that they wanted to sign me straight away, and then I've been at City now. This is my fifth season. Talk me through what is it like being an academy player? It's quite a lot as well. There's a balance in school with it as well. I finished school, then I come to City around like half five, six ish. Mm -hmm. Then we do like the gym for like 45 minutes. We do an analysis, so like of the previous game that we've just played. Then we go onto the pitch and then do a pitch session for about an hour and a half. Then we finish around like nine ish. You've made your first team debut, so how is it? It's, it's crazy when you think about it outside the picture, but um, all the hard work that I've put in and to get where I am now is definitely paid off. Because you have a setup like this and everything is professional and that development that there is now for women to get to the top, do you feel any pressure thinking about making it at that top level? I feel like it's more pressure on ourselves than anyone else putting it on us, but obviously that's... It's good pressure, it's not bad pressure, so it's like... It just... That pressure just makes us thrive off it mm -hmm. and makes us want to be the best we could be, it, really. These are the pitches and they kind of surround the perimeter of the building. Obviously, the academy stadium is just across the way as well. Mm -hmm. I remember playing pre-season games against Man City on that pitch right there. Yeah, it's actually where <laughs> our oldest group played, the girls as well. So, um, yeah, it's, it's great, isn't it, to be part of it. When you first come in this environment, it is mm -hmm. fit for any player, I think, especially younger players, when they come in and go, wow. Yeah. It's... But you think, like, the game has come this far. What more needs to be done, do you think, to carry this momentum in women's football? The game has grown really quickly, in my eyes, mm -hmm. to be fair, when you think 20 years ago where we were. But when you think of the individual person that's impacting the game, the player, there's a lot more that can be done yeah. if we can put them in well-supported environments, look after their welfare, obviously, through potentially a 10 to 12-year development programme. I think what you will then have is a game at the top level that will look different mm -hmm. in lots of good ways. I feel so reassured knowing former players like Jane are looking after the welfare of the next generation. For some women in the game, that support has been missing in one vital area. I know so many players from over the years that put off having a family simply because there was not the support in place to take time off from their clubs to have children. There was also this unspoken fear that if you did start a family, you would lose your career, leaving you with a choice, family or career. It's actually ludicrous when you think about it, but hopefully for the sake of the game and its future, it's all starting to change. In February this year, the FA announced it would be mandatory for WSL clubs to pay maternity leave for 14 weeks from next season, something that was previously only at a club's discretion. My first question is, why is it taking us so long? I just like that it's now spoken about and it's an option, because I think previously you had to have your football career and then you could retire and think about having a child. Coming back to the fact that the game's only been fully professional since 2018, you know, there's a range of work to do and there's a range of investments to make. And so, um, you know, and, and we wanted to do it properly and do it well and consult properly with, with the clubs and with the players. So, you know, we took the time to do it and try and get it right. The idea that you could fall pregnant and then be in fear for your the future of your career and where your money's going to come from, like, is just absolutely horrific, right? So 
the fact that there are now a minimum uh, requirement for clubs uh, to meet that protects the rights of pregnant players and players on maternity leave is so important. It's a huge step forward in the game, which has been long overdue. I'm going to see my ex-teammate and new mum, Emma Mitchell, who currently plays for Reading, to see what she makes of these changes. Hello, hello, hello. Oh, look at her. So good to see you. And you. you. Hello, gorgeous. Hello. These are some ales. Are you going to show me around the house? Come yeah, in. that's a yes. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Star of the show. <laughs> What's going on? What's going on? You just like to see Alex. When you went to speak to your coaches, what was that conversation like? I was eight weeks pregnant at this point, so like we're two months in, so I was thinking, like, okay, this is like what's the worst case scenario here? They couldn't exactly like sack me, but hundred percent, I think there is that fear still that you say to your coach that you're pregnant and that you know that you've made that, like, we've had to make that decision for that to be the case, knowing that then I'm not going to be able to play past that point. You never know what people's reactions are going to be, but, no, everybody was, like, delighted and, yeah, I got a, like, really positive response for them, so... And did you know what maternity things were in place for you within football? I knew that there was nothing in my contract whatsoever to say that, like, you could have a baby, but, you know, I can't really fault read them because the whole time that they have supported me, like, financially, like, I know that they only, they only have to give you, like, 14 weeks, whereas, like... I know what my labour was like, and I literally couldn't sit down for the first six. So, like, how am I meant to then go and be on the pitch and back in the gym and training after 14 weeks? Like, for me, I'm just like, that's genuinely crazy. I feel like whatever going forward, there needs to be stuff in place that I shouldn't have to then go and ask. Just logistically and that, like, what's the protocol if they've got an away game and, like, I'm breastfeeding, so in us to come, like, how do then we get to the game? Because she's so young, she's still going to have to be in a car seat, so we can't then go in the coach. Like, there's nothing in the policy to say that. Probably just needs like somebody like myself to maybe go through it then at the back it'd be like, this is what I felt like could have been better and this is what you should put in place to make it easier for other people because then I think that's important and it's, yeah, my job to do that, isn't it? And so can I give cuddles now to Ines? Of course you can, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was great speaking to Emma and meeting baby Ines, but there's clearly much more to be done around supporting players before and after having a child. As both a mum and a manager, this was something I was keen to ask Emma Hayes about. It shouldn't be taboo. A woman has a right to have a baby, and if she chooses to do it during a managerial career or a playing career, we need to best support that. And I, I still think the game is learning about how best to do that. I think it's really important you talk about the importance uh, that we have pelvic floor specialists in women's teams, or that we have menstrual cycle experts, or we have gynaecologists. At the PFA, we would like to hope that that support, we would put that support in place for players in terms of wellbeing support. They could come to us externally, um, but clubs having that wellbeing and player care within the club, for me, that's really important. I know a lot of my ex-teammates have probably had to wait until the end of the career and to wait to have a baby and have a family because of that security, whereas now it's a little bit more normalised and there's big players that have started to do it, the likes of Alex Morgan's being able to carry on after having her baby and I think it now becomes a little bit more normal, but it's probably taken a bit far too long to get to this point, but we've got there and hopefully them con discussions can continue. Um, in a good way. Steph's so right. The more mothers we see in the game, the more players will feel having children is a viable option and won't cost them their career. from speaking to various different people throughout this program that there are a number of different factors that's going to help this beautiful game continue to grow. You've got the clubs, the fans and the players themselves but ultimately there is one underlying factor in all of this and that lies with the governing bodies themselves. So I've popped over to Switzerland, the home of UEFA, to speak to the woman placed in charge of helping this game grow. Hello. Hello. Good Welcome. to see you. 
Do you know what? I've not been here. This is the first time. It's good to have you here. Um, what have you? <laughs> Where's your office? Nadine Kesler is a former player who knows the game inside out. She's won the Champions League on three occasions and the Women's Euros with Germany. I mean, how do you even get work done? <laughs> if I had this all the time. I'm excited that someone with her knowledge and experience is so central to leading the women's game going forward into this pivotal period. So what does she feel are the key developments needed for the women's game to grow? The tendencies, uh, if we are honest with ourselves, is the topic to be judged on, either in a good or bad way. Yeah. Uh, and so we made sure that, that clubs have enough flexibility to also host their uh, women's teams in their big stadia. If you put it on a stage, people will come. And we had a world record in Barcelona, but we also had records, individual records all over Europe and all clubs opened their stadia. And in all of these matches, uh, people come and enjoy the matches. The football was great. I might be biased, but I think it was great. <laughs> it was. Do you think the growth of the game it is sustainable at the moment? Because I, it has been this rapid increase, isn't it? I, I completely agree. Um, the in the interest increase is so, yeah, unprecedented and also unpredictable in a good way um, that we've got to be careful yeah. because I, I really think uh, sustainability for women's football should be one of our key goals. We need more investment. We need to push for more investment, but we need to make sure that we start standing on our own two feet. Mm -hmm. So how excited are you for the Euros to be happening? Because I feel like we're on a tipping point once again. I, I am super excited. We've been working really hard for this event. I'm, um, I cannot wait for it to start and to yeah, be another milestone, hopefully of many to come, um, that, that will leave a, a huge impact uh, on our game. Um, this Euro is a special one. The expectations are high, the pressure is on. So uh, we hope we can um, yeah, finish the Euro with an exclamation mark. For me, the encouraging thing is you have a former player that has seen what it's like and is in a position and it's coming from a great place to push this game forward. And she's not just in pose, she's doing everything she can to make sure this game develops and is heading in the right direction. And she knows there's challenges ahead and she's willing to fight and face them. But the more people I speak to about the Euros, I'm just so excited and cannot wait for this event to begin. We're off to the BBC press launch, which basically means you sit down, you talk to a load of journalists about everything that is going to be happening during the Euros, which is always exciting because it just makes it feel so real. All the way, all the talk is over, and now it begins. we've got loads more to do to push it to where we want it to be. It feels like the growth in the last 10 years or so has just really accelerated in a way that we've not seen before. This summer's UEFA Women's Euros will be played in nine cities across England, with the final taking place at Wembley. Gabby Logan has presented women's football for more than a decade and has seen the game grow so much in that time. Gabby, you think doing a launch like this, I don't know, I think back when I was playing, there was never this sort of thing going on into a start of a Euros or a competition. Does this make it feel real or how excited does this make you? Well, going back to 2009, I just joined the BBC. There was no launch. We yeah. joined it halfway through. <laughs> you know, it had already started and it was a case of, oh, well, let's see, oh, England look like they're going to be they're going to be all right in this tournament. Mm -hmm. So let's see if we can, you know, jump on the back of it. And apparently only two million people watched the whole 
small thing. When you jump forward to 2019 and nearly 30 million people watched the World Cup, it just shows you kind of the progress in less than 15 years. You've been, I would say, at the forefront of women's football in terms of broadcasting. How do you feel personally to see the growth of the women's game and for you to be across it all as well? It is really exciting to think. It makes you feel quite old. But it's, <laughs> I did but say it's, that. Okay. But it is really exciting to have been kind of in, involved, you know, from a broadcasting point of view, from those early days where not certainly not all domestic matches were on telly, yes. even professional, but for the, for the England matches, it's what I first got involved with from a television point of view. And that's just 12, 13 years that that has changed so much. That leaves me with a level of kind of feeling real kind of security. This is going to be OK. So just one thing left, really. I see you at the opening game. Yeah, that opening game at Old Trafford, I think, is going to be uh, quite emotional, yeah. actually, thinking like, about it now. You speaking about it, it's actually giving me goosebumps to think and so just imagine when we are there in the atmosphere it's yeah. going to be special there's so much talk about pressure and i'm so excited you know when i think about it i don't think about being in a pressured situation I, yeah i think how like many good pressure just, yeah like yeah. if you had told me as a kid that i'd be you know playing at old trafford sold out for england in a home euro it's like that is and captain <laughs> <laughs> there, there you go again <laughs> Um, I'm proud of you. What <laughs> you know, I'm so passionate about playing for Northern Ireland. It's everything I ever wanted to do. And to be a part of that team, first team to qualify for a major tournament is literally every single dream I had when I played out on the street. And you envision yourself playing in a European championship for your country. And to have made that happen is just, I don't think anything will ever top that in my life. And now, a little girl's dream can become a reality. Oh, well done, keeper, well done. Seeing these youngsters enjoying themselves makes me so emotional. OK. Nice. <laughs> Just like that. Poppy's plan. That's Poppy's plan. I can't help but get excited about how many more opportunities they will have. And that's one of the biggest takeaways for me from making this documentary. Jackets off. Make sure you're all warm as well. Do some warm ups. Oh, listen to coach, not me. Sorry. I need to stop interfering. I've met some incredible people and seen how those running the game care as passionately as I do about women's football. I know things are far from perfect. We still need players from a wider range of backgrounds. The support for mums returning to play must be better. And we need the sport to be seen by more and more people. But I'm confident we're heading in the right direction. I think the smile on my face says just how proud I am of how far women's football has come. High fives all round. Woo woo! And it's these young girls who are now reaping the benefits. Shall we do a team photo? Yeah! Come on then. It's been a long journey to get to this point, but I can only see it getting bigger and better. And there's some really inspiring women in high profile positions across the game, as well as male allies helping back and drive the game forward. One, two, three, seven. So is the game I love in safe hands? Yes! You bet it is. <laughs>